before I went on Tumblr, someone actually made a Rooks Tumblr, Whoa. took all my photos, cropped the logo out, and pretended to be me. And it was like this 19 year old kid from like Australia. Dead Mouse, and then I stopped, and then I did Swedish House Mafia, and the whole one last tour thing. And then that stopped, and then it was Zed. This is Lauren Engel of Sidewalk Talk to him here with Brooks. Hey. <laughs> so you're originally born in Long Island? Yes. Are your parents originally from there as well? Yep. What do they do? Uh, my dad is a commodities broker. My mom is just a housewife. Oh. Where do you think you got your creative side from then? Um, movies and video games, I guess. Oh. Because, I mean, I just love playing, like, Nintendo, Super Nintendo, and just, like, I really was into like good graphics and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and, like noticing the pixel art, how good it is, and watching good movies and being like, oh, look how they framed that and everything like that, and mm -hmm. that like kind of stands out to me. I just kind of recognized what stood out naturally, you know, mm -hmm. just like composition. And did your dad also play around with photography? No. Oh, so you just like, all fun ba it Yeah, basically they just had their own little film camera. Yeah. And every now and then it'd be like, we'd be like at a family thing, like, oh, Drew, would take a picture of us and that would be it. And that was the whole extent of photography for them. Mm -hmm. And for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and did you realize from the onset that you wanted to do something creative? Uh, not really. I just didn't know what I wanted to do. At first I wanted to work in the video game industry, so that's where I started. And I figured that would would help me get something creatively going, like maybe working on a game or developing a game. But then I realized it wasn't really for me, so then I kind of switched over once I started doing photography. So did you go to college? Yes. What did you study? Uh, journalism. Oh. Yeah. Did you really like it? Yeah. I mean, I did. I worked for um, some video game websites in the, er in the beginning, like gaming age and stuff like that like doing reviews and stuff like that and then that branched out to like working for a video game company doing QA testing and I almost got up to like associate producer level mm -hmm. but then then I moved to uh, LA and it got bankrupt <laughs> huh? the company got bankrupt well I actually funny thing is I left a claim like two weeks before they went bankrupt and shut yeah. down. It was like complete coincidence because I was just like, hey guys, I'm moving to LA, see you guys later. I'm like, oh, we'll miss you. Then I get to California and like two weeks later, it shut down. I'm like, holy crap, I kind of avoided that. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing about that was when I moved to LA, I worked for, I think like 2K Games and THQ and everything like that because they were in the Valley. And they basically like, I had this huge impressive resume of all the stuff that I did. I'm like, we don't care, start from the bottom again. I'm like. Is that really common in video games? I was kind of surprised when I read that in your previous interviews. What do you mean? To like start for like video games, like they can't just hire you as your experience? I don't know. I mean, I just figured, I mean, even like the special skills in QA testing that I learned that would be good, like TCRs and stuff like that, they didn't even really care. They just was like, well, you're new, you're starting from the beginning. I'm like, I did all this already and I did it very, very well. And it's kind of weird that you're not utilizing me for my skills, you know? Yeah. So it was a bit disheartening. And then mm -hmm. that's kind of when I took up photography and going to Avalon on weekends. Mm -hmm. And then I just kind of well, was like, hey, I'm liking this a lot. I think yeah. maybe I'll do this. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, for the random person who's watching who's somehow curious in the video game industry, what kind of tips would you have for them to get in it? To get into the video game industry? Yeah. I mean... Uh, the basic way is just to like start off as a tester, I guess. I mean, it's probably changed because I, this is like over 10 years ago mm -hmm. since I did it. But I mean, just starting off as a QA tester and it's really shitty hours and really long work. But if you do a good job, then you usually get promoted pretty quickly to like yeah. managing testing a game and then keeps on going up from there. Mm -hmm. Do you, I guess you don't need like a computer science or anime nah. background, you could just say you just, you just need to know how to write well and how to figure out stuff. Mm -hmm. Like I mean, when I worked there, 
there were a lot of people that just like would write a bug report and it would just be like sloppy and you know, like you don't understand what they're saying because you have to like provide the exact steps to like replicate the bug or people that would just like see something wrong that's not actually a bug and then report it anyway and sometimes I would have to I've worked on the night shift and like some games uh, that I worked on the people on the day shift would just like put up like oh we have 50 new bugs and I'd go through them and like half of them weren't even bugs and I'd have to like <laughs> close them not a bug close them not a bug to the point where like the manager's like you gotta stop doing this they're getting kind of like <laughs> mad at you for doing them like but they're literally not a bug it's just ruining the whole process so like just let it go and we'll handle it <laughs> great and I guess you're used to the crazy hours since you're like video game jobs like all over the place so going yeah. into I mean it worked out well because I was always like a night person and I worked on the night shift when I did QA testing so it was I forgot the actual hours I think it was like like around three in the afternoon to maybe around like 11 at night or something like that and that facilitated me being able to stay up for yeah. going to Avalon and stuff like that in my spare time on the weekends. Mm -hmm. How did you first find EDM? Um, I just, I just happened to start listening to it. I forgot how, like I came across it. I think I might have just heard some stuff online and I think it was 1999 and I just started listening to like hybrid and BT and like new school breaks and stuff like that. And then just branching out and trying to listen to everything and seeing what I liked, what type of genres I liked and didn't like and everything like that. And who were the first artists that you were shooting for at the nightclub? Um, it, when I started, I like even before I was officially hired by Avalon, it was just like a lot of good people like Sasha, Junkie XL, Rabbit in the Moon, just like a lot of the people that are actually still doing work in the industry. Mm -hmm. And did it click to you like the first time that you're like, I could do this for a living? No, no, definitely no? not. I was, I had no clue what I was doing. I just like was literally learning how to use a camera at the same time. And I was just taking pictures and just like waiting for someone to say what I'm doing wrong or what's good or what's not good and everything like that. And a lot of the artists I worked with, a lot of photographer friends were like, you got to do this a little bit more, you got to try this. And whenever I'd do a good, whenever I'd create a good photo, they'd be like, well, no, this is what you have to aim for. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, maybe. And then I just started developing from there. During that time, were there a lot of other EDM photographers? No. I mean, I was one of the only ones. I mean, most of the photographers are like party photographers that would just, were more just like, go to a, go to a club, take a hundred pictures of hot girls and maybe like one picture of the DJ. Yeah. <laughs> and I kind of was like, you know what, I, the deep people are, the DJs are very important because, you know, they are producing amazing songs and people are coming to see them in general. Still back then, a lot of people were like, oh, let's just go to the club instead of like, oh, so-and-so's playing. And I figured, you know, some more focus needs to be put on them because they're actual musicians. They're not just like some random like local person playing other people's records. They're actually making most of the music that they're playing, you know? Mm -hmm. And did you make extra effort from the onset to build a relationship with all the artists that you saw? Oh yeah, definitely. I yeah. mean, they were doing the same with me, which was good because they were saying, oh, well, wow, this person's actually paying attention to us and trying to make us look good so you know i would i would just like hang out with like a bunch of djs like junkie xl used to invite me to his like holiday parties at his house and stuff like that and whenever a bunch of djs would just like be backstage to see another dj we'd just like literally just talk about the industry and music and photography and stuff like that and then you were also like right after the event like sending these photos to their team so they could use it i guess this was before our social though right or MySpace out <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was before then. So basically, when it first started, started, there was really like no market really. So it was just like, uh, it was just for fun. It was just like, oh, just go to a club, listen to the music I like, take pictures. And then I would just put them on my website for other people, other fans of the artists to check out. So I'd just like post in their, fan, their message board and be like, hey, I just took pictures of so-and-so at this club, check them out. And then only when um, Avalon hired me, to do it weekly they were the 
mean people like, hey, we need photos and we could use it for press and stuff like that. And that was still before social media, really. Mm -hmm. So back then it was more the club paying me to take pictures for their use. Yeah. Because artists really didn't have much use for it other than maybe occasionally like, hey, we need a good photo for or like a magazine cover or magazine oh, article yeah. will license it from you. And that's mm -hmm. about it. And what, so what year did you start your website? Mm. That's a good question. Um, I think I start. I started it um, 2004 oh when I gosh. started when I started photography. Because oh my god, or maybe 15 even, years ago. Maybe even earlier than that. It's because like a teenager by now. <laughs> basically, yeah. Like I think I originally started it as just a place to because I used to look for like rare promos of like music of the artists that I like. So back then I would like rip all the music to my hard drive and put it on my like music player and then with with um, Winamp they had this really cool thing where you could just load up all your music in there and export an HTML list of all your music so I would just like make it and put it up on my website just to show people some of the crazy tracks and stuff that are out there mm -hmm. and then um, I meant when I when I um, first did my first ever photo thing at a club which was BT at Avalon and New York, I basically, that's when I first started with the photo gallery. So I just created the photo gallery, uploaded it, and literally just put a link on the text homepage yeah. on my website <laughs> and had the link there. And then it just started growing and growing and growing. And then after I started getting jobs doing it, then I said, okay, I got to actually have a friend make a website for me. And mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And uh, how were you able to get traction to it? Like, do you still have, I guess you still have, like, monthly users that come time and time just to check what you're up to, but how did you build that out before social? Um, it was just interacting with fans, basically. It was, yeah. like I said, it was just, like, kind of, I would find an artist, and usually the most active places were, like, their message boards, like, on their, on their actual website. Mm-hmm. So, like, take pictures of, like, Tiesto and then go on the Tiesto message board oh, on his website yeah. and then post, hey, here's some pictures of Tiesto at so-and-so. And then that's how I got some followers because everyone just went directly to the website since there's no social media. Mm -hmm. So that's how I kind of yeah. got people's attention. And then did you hop on social media? Did you realize how important it would be for you to spend a lot of time in from the onset? Or were you just, were just throwing up photos and not really paying too much attention? It was a little mixed. I think at first, I was, I always waited until like a social media thing grew before I jumped on it. So like, I wasn't like, oh my God, this Twitter thing, I gotta jump on it. I was like, let me see how it is first. And if it's staying, and staying around, because I didn't want to waste my time putting yeah. work into something that's going to like go under in like a month or two. Mm -hmm. So I, I waited a good amount of time for a lot of things and then I'd always judge to see what would be best. So like fa originally Facebook pages were amazing and that was like my main thing, go-do. Then I spend once that started dying, then I switched to Instagram. Even though I had an Instagram, it wasn't doing too well. So like once Facebook pages died, I went right back to Instagram and I was getting like a a thousand followers a week for like a few years mm -hmm. and that's when I built my my followers from like 20,000 to like 250,000 know? yeah because it would just be like I haven't posted on this in a while and then I'd post something and hundreds and like thousands of people would like it mm -hmm. and I was like oh my god this is amazing yeah a thousand a, month, a thousand a week I just keep on doing it yeah. doing and doing and doing it and then of course Instagram is crappy again now so <laughs> Um, how would you say your workflow has changed because of social media? Like, are artists getting more intense about, like, I need this photo ASAP, and, like, you're, do you have pressure on yourself? Not really. I mean, I've always been... I've always had the mindset that people need to see things as soon as possible. Yeah. But in the best way possible. So, it would... Uh, when, I, when I still did clubs in L.A., it was to the point where I would actually leave the club early if it was like open till four and like the closer went on i'd take like two pictures of the closer go home edit all the pictures and then send it to and put up the gallery and send the pictures to the club before the club even closed that night <laughs> wow. i would just because back then i just shot in jpeg and yeah. i edited in 
Photoshop. I just load everything in Photoshop and just do like yeah. very basic tweaks. Yeah. And it was super, super quick and super easy. Mm -hmm. But of course now I use Shoot and Raw and I use Lightroom and I give photos a little bit more scrutiny and everything like that, but I still like to get things done as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. And when did you come up with your watermark? Did you realize that you needed it from the onset? Uh, I came up with the watermark, well, a friend suggested it because I think, I forgot who I was taking pictures of, but it was at a club in LA and they were like warning me like, oh, this person you're going to take pictures of tonight, they like to like steal photos and not give photo credit and oh, use wow. them for stuff like that. So you should put a watermark on them. So I put like a little transparent uh, Rooks.com or Drew Wrestler in the middle of it. So at least there'd be like a little wa literal watermark in the middle. And then eventually I kind of was like, you know what, this is kind of distracting a little bit. Like most photos, it wasn't distracting, but some it was. So then I had one of my friends who developed my website develop a logo for me. And he made the Rooks.com logo in that specific font. Have you had problems with people cropping it out? Oh yeah. Yeah, that's so annoying. But I mean, for the most part, um, it's been it's been less and less as the years went on, actually. Yeah, like I think it, people are more aware now. Yeah, because I think they respect it a little bit more. They're like, oh, yeah. it's a Rooks photo. We shouldn't like mess with it. Like back then, it would just be like, oh, let's crop it out. We don't want the logo. I'm like, you could just ask me, and I'll give it to you without the logo. But also a lot of times people would just pretend to like to be me. Like I would get like I when before I went on Tumblr, someone actually made a Rooks Tumblr. Whoa. Took all my photos, cropped the logo out, and pretended to be me. And it was like this nineteen year old kid from like Australia. So I <laughs> copyright infringed everything and got it shut down. Yeah. yeah, and so who are the first artists that brought you on tour after Avalon? Or how long did you actually work at Avalon? I worked until um 2011, I think. Yeah. It was just as things went on, at the beginning it was just nothing but Avalon, then Insomniac hired me in like 2007 to do like EDC and all the, their festival stuff, so that would work their way in, and then then they started doing um, Vanguard in LA, so then I started fitting that in, and then Giant started doing like Thursdays in Orange County, so it just kind of became like a regular set schedule with like one or two festivals in between. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of 2007, I was introduced to Dead Mouse, and then he brought me out for WMC in Miami in 2008. And then after that, he's like, well, we're gonna do a tour and come, all, come along. I'm like, okay. Actually with Dead Mouse, what was the thing of the Hello Kitty costume? Oh, that, yeah, that was, um. When we had um, this Europe tour, and we ended up, like the last bit was in um, the UK, and then I forgot who came up with it, but it was um, Sophie, Tommy Lee, Joel's girlfriend, Joel and his girlfriend, and they just decided, you know what, why don't we go to like a costume shop and get full body costumes and then just run around in the crowd before the show and make people go, what the fuck is going on here? And Rooks could just take pictures of people going with the fuck and just like all these Hello Kitties and Pink Panthers dancing in the middle of a crowd of an empty <laughs> show. And they ended up doing that and we like wandered around the, the show before it opened. And then one time I was, and then um, we were editing the photos. While I was editing the photos after we just did like a big walk through the venue and Joel was still in his Hello Kitty costume and it was on like one of those trailers inside the backstage of the venue. So I was just sitting on the table editing my photos and I just heard knock, knock. And I look and there's like a Hello Kitty with a hand like this going. And I could just see Joel's face inside of there yeah. behind the mask going, what the fuck did I just do? Cause he just like banged on the glass, <laughs> oh but it was very weak glass. And he just, and just seeing like a Hello Kitty that punched <laughs> the glass to get my attention was just like, oh my God. <laughs> You met a lot of these people like Zed, Steve, like before they blew up, right? Yeah, pretty all much. People, I mean, yeah. all, all of it was pretty much networking and just being at the right place at the right time sometimes. Like with Zed, I met him when uh, he opened for Dead Mouse in Taiwan, of all places. <laughs> and Sophie knew him because he was from Germany too, and then introduced everybody, and then when he came out, 
to LA for the first time, he was working on Clarity and he had me come over and oh, take wow. pictures of him making the album and stuff like that. Actually, with that, do you want to <laughs> elaborate on your comment? I think people, I covered it in the EDM news, but I think people were curious about your check your DM. Which one? About Zed and Matthew Coma. Do you oh. want to talk about it? No. no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, who else? Who, who was the next artist after that? I mean, I think for the major touring, that pretty much was it because it was just, it was um, basically Dead Mouse, and then I stopped, and then I did Swedish House Mafia, and the whole one last tour thing, and then that stopped, and then it was Zed, and then I stopped with that. And it's gotten to the point where touring is a bit difficult if it's not a like live act. Like, mm. Danilo has it lucky because he's got the chain smokers and they actually have a live act and yeah. things move around and do stuff, but doing getting pictures of a DJ that just stands in the booth the whole time, yeah. and it's the same set every gig, and the same production, and the same visuals every gig, it's difficult, because you want to just constantly work, but at the same time, you can't be like, you can't go crazy every gig, because and every gallery looks the same, so you gotta be like, okay, got this visual from front of house last night, so this night I'll get it from the stage, and it's basically just a lot of switching, and it's repetitive yeah and it kills you creatively a little bit because the only creative difference you really have between gigs is the venue itself and how it's laid out and like oh well the, there's a balcony here I could use that or the front of house is off to the side so I can't use that you know mm -hmm. does it get so repetitive uh, repetitive that you want to just change to some other photography no I mean it just uh, the thing that helped me with that was just doing more festivals and doing more one-offs. So instead of doing entire tours, like for Elenium and Excision and stuff like that, they'll just bring me out for like the big important gigs. And oh, then they'll have yeah. their own tour photographer for like all the smaller ones in between, which also gives me space to do festivals. So since there's tons and tons of festivals, like back when I started, there was maybe like one festival every three months. Now there's like almost a festival every week. Yeah. So it's... <laughs> It's so crazy. it's affecting it's affecting tours too because now tours aren't doing well for a specific artists because mm. they'll just be like oh well, we'll just wait till they come to the oh, festival. Yeah. So that's why artists have to spend tons of money to make them something special to get people to come out to their mm -hmm. tours. But, Do you, yeah. But doing festivals, I like it a bit better because I get to make a lot more DJs happy because I, I could just take pictures of the entire lineup on a stage and then all of them are like oh we got new pictures that's great. And then uh, there's always a variety with different visual styles and them doing different things. Like if Stevie Oak is in the lineup, I'm like, okay, now I know I can get some action stuff and oh, take yeah. their own and stuff like that. And in the past few years, I feel like there's just been so many more EDM photographers. Do you ever think it's uh, competitive in a certain way? Or if artists are like, oh, well, this guy can do it for like X amount less? Or you don't... Oh, it yeah. yeah. It's definitely much more competitive and there's definitely a lot of people that'll work for free and, you know, try to do it for the party aspect yeah. but thankfully it's it's kind of um a lot of people realize that like the people that the way i looked at it is that the people that need media are willing to sacrifice quality for someone that's working for free yeah but once someone starts like a promoter or an artist starts making a lot of money then like okay we could afford like a real professional photographer mm -hmm. and we don't have to deal with like this free person anymore mm -hmm. so it kind of weeds itself out in the end but it's still kind of difficult to deal with every now and then yeah actually what advice do you have for um people who want to be photographers and figuring out rates and not like how they price themselves and also like if they want to like increase it a bit in the future what kind of advice do you have i mean it's it's that's a very tough subject to deal with because i mean at this point I have a manager, so she oh, sets okay. my rate and everything. But I mean, it's basically what you're worth, and it's, it's tough. But you gotta maybe find someone else in the industry to ask them how much you get paid. Like, you sh it's not like someone that's starting out should ask me how much you get paid. It's someone else that's starting out asking someone else that's just starting out and getting paid how much they're getting paid, and just figuring out what they're worth and that's about it really yeah I mean, it's it's a and you could ask any photographer how much they get paid and 90 percent of the time they'll just will tell you a wrong thing like oh like if they get paid like 
eight hundred dollars, they'll be like, oh, I only get paid like five hundred dollars. You know? Yeah. It's that kind of industry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and how how do you figure it out? Like, do you would would you like the same artist? Would you like okay, I'm gonna increase my rates by this much? Would you ever be like early on? Would you ever be afraid of like oh like you don't want to like because they can yeah. find someone else? Yeah. Yeah, def definitely. It was always it was always a very touchy subject yeah. because like you said, I didn't want to be like. I need this much money, you can't have me. It's more kind of like, uh, I'd like a little bit more money, but if you don't want to give it to me, it's okay, just let me know. I mean, yeah. just, just very unsure because I didn't want to be like, no, we don't want to use you. So I kind of had to find the right balance of saying, I kind of deserve a little bit more money, but at the same time, if you don't want to pay the raise, I won't quit, but at the same time, know that someone else might pay that mon money, oh, and then I might true. switch to them kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And when do you start having a manager? Uh, probably like five years ago, maybe. Like, I just did a Coachella, when Coachella had actual EDM artists, and... <laughs> More than more than two or three. Yeah. And then the Sahara Town would be just be like packed with like tons of people, and it would be at the point where I would just, for Coachella, I would just book the hotel myself, and then just divide up the hotel and a fee to all the DJs on the lineup, and just split everything oh, so yeah. everyone would get me for a decent rate, but I'd be paid a full day's rate, full festival day's rate in the end. But because of that, it was very difficult to chase up invoices you know because oh, having yeah. like 10 people on a lineup and each of them have to individually pay for their share of my hotel and my fee and then like after a week only like three or four of them pay and then yeah. I have to send everyone an email reminder and then one person pays and then it'd just be like I'm at doing other work and half the people still haven't paid and I'm mm. just like I can't I can't do this I can't spend my time worrying about money coming in or chasing it up. I need someone to just like get people, get people to give me their, my money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that way I don't have to worry about it. And then when it comes in, it comes in and I don't have to be like bug them, you know? And mm -hmm. then she is able to handle getting my money, giving, getting me a little bit more money, getting my worth, stuff like that. And does she also do um, networking or you already have other connections? Uh, it's a mix. I mean, I have a lot of connections already, and I do like I do like being involved, but at the same time, she'll bring some stuff to the table, like, oh, we have this option, you want to do this, stuff like that. And going back to artists, how did you meet Avicii? I actually met him through Dead Mouse, because oh. um, we were at WMC, and he just happened to come by. He was at the, actually the entrance of the hotel that we're staying at, and then him and Joel were just like talking outside and I just got introduced to him mm -hmm. then. And then he played like his first gig opening for like Judge Jules at Music Box here in LA and I took pictures of that. Yeah. And then just like everything else, it just grew from there. And it's like, oh, we need a photographer, come on tour, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. What was your reaction when you heard about his news? It was really disappointing. Yeah. yeah. And because you how. How long would you have, would you say you've spent with him, like half a year in total or, or more? No, definitely more, maybe like yeah. two years. Wow. Because we did, we did a bunch of tours and stuff like that. And I still, even when he wasn't touring, like I, I, I stored, I toured with him all the way up until he had the uh, gallbladder surgery and had to yeah. cancel his Avicii oh. Hotel gig. Yeah. And that was like kind of like the last gig that I did for him. Um. And, but then I saw him at ultra events when he was recovering here and there, like Ultra Miami and Ultra Korea and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then I, it's always tough to keep in contact with DJs because yeah. a lot of times their numbers change a lot. So like I would, I would even after all that, I would still text him every now and then, be like, hey, let's play some Hearthstone together. Mm -hmm. But then a lot of times it just wouldn't get delivered and you're like, oh great, they changed the number again. How do I get in contact with them to get the new number, you know? And then yeah. it's, it's always, it's always difficult dealing with that. But mm -hmm. at least with WhatsApp now, it changes oh, yeah. with the number, so it happens a lot less. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How would you say that uh, mental health is handled in the EDM community? I mean, honestly, it's a little bit better, but there's still, I mean, a long, long, long way to go. I mean, it's, especially for me, it, like, with the mental health issues that I have and my family has, it's very difficult to do a lot of things, you know? And... Um, 
dealing with like I've had for a, a long time I've had like anxiety and depression mm. and it's still not gone but every year it gets slightly better and better and better and you know I've had to deal with family members suicidal family members that are luckily are still around mm. and everything like that but it's it's kind of the industry kind of pushes you yeah. a lot especially for artists because like Alice in Wonderland recently had, she basically stopped doing a tour because of her uh, mental yeah. health. And she's extremely lucky to do that because there are some management companies or people that are just like, well, this person will lose a lot of money if they stop their tour. So we're going to try to convince them to get over their mental health issues and just push through and get it done, you know, because they're like, well, if they lose money and we don't get paid. And it's just a whole money issue instead of a mental health issue. And it's very disappointing because mental health is probably one of the most important things in the world you know mm -hmm. if if a dj is having issues if they stop and then can come back later it's 10 times better in the long run than the damage that will be done if they're forced to keep on going you know yeah um and you said your um, anxiety and depression has been getting less like what do you attribute that to I mean, at the beginning, I was, like, really, really bad. This was, like, when I first moved to L.A. and everything, and I was put on medication for that and went to therapy and stuff like that. But that all helped push it, and just getting out and doing stuff and talking to people helps a lot. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's still, things pop up, like, oh, my God. And But then I, I'm getting to the point where I could convince myself to get out of it, you know? Yeah. But it's very, it takes years and years and years to actually be able to do that. And still, it's not like the most optimal thing because you still have it, you know. Mm. But it just, you could get rid of it a little bit better. And when did he start having merch? Um, original, I did it a few years ago. I just did like works t shirts and stuff like that. And I gave them out to like friends. And then eventually I did more like kind of branded stuff, but that never really took off. And then I worked with. Uh, I heard raves and we did the whole like photo like photo covered like hoodie and t-shirt and stuff like that which worked out pretty well but the only problem is because it was like an all over coverage thing every item had to be like made on demand you know it wasn't uh, something that they yeah. could just like have sitting in a warehouse and that hurt that didn't help it grow a lot so we ended up stopping doing that and now I'm working with um Electric Family, and we're going to start a t-shirt line oh, nice. starting at the end of October. Nice. And it's going to be, like, actually supported and endorsed by the artists and everything in the photos. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be pretty limited t-shirts, and it's going to be, like, photo on the front and on the back, the actual camera settings, too, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So, hopefully uh, that'll work out. Yeah. <laughs> what are your future goals for your career? Do you want to keep doing the same thing, or...? Uh, it's... I just never know, you know? I, I like where I am now, and I just hope it keeps it going, and just expanding my photography, doing more photography-related things. That's yeah. about it, really. I mean, just seeing where it goes, hoping it continues, and mm -hmm. it's... Every year that I, every year, every year that I'm like, oh, great, this is like the last year, <laughs> then I might be able to do this because the industry is going to crap, it would end up being like my best year. And <laughs> like, oh, okay, that worked out well, I'm mm -hmm. keep on going. And is there a reason why you don't want to like start a team or like you like you employ people under you? I mean, that might happen eventually if like I start getting really, really tired of doing what I do. But for now, I just, I, I just like Rook's photos being from me, you know? Yeah. It's, it'd be kind of tough to just be like, because there are other people that will just, everyone will dump their raws and then one person will edit them and they'll be like, hey, this is this group's photos and everything like that. And that's kind of, that's to me, that's not, that's base, it's, it's a, it's a collaboration, but I kind of like every, I like people knowing that my photo is everything from me, from taking the picture to editing to uploading, you know? Mm -hmm. But Again, like I said, if I eventually get tired of it, then I'll start hiring a team and then doing that kind of thing. But it's yeah. probably not going to be for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, with your name, it's... I mean, back then, I didn't really know too many photographers who had a 
moniker, right? Like most photographers yeah. go by their own names. So like back then, that was even before like social media when you had to think of a handle. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, I know that it's because of the AOL, like the the K and the L got swapped. Yeah. Um, but like, how did you decide that? Like, I'm not gonna go by my normal name. I just thought that it just my uh, it just was like a bit. My normal name would be long Drew Wrestler. and just kind of like <laughs> some people have trouble pronoun pronouncing the last name. So I'm like, I don't want to have to have deal with that. You know, my photography job, I don't want people saying, oh, check out Drew those photos. You know, I just want someone to be able to look at and be like, oh, Rooks. Yeah. You know? And do most Something people short. just call you Rooks now? Like they just spot you and they're like, oh, it's Rooks. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> short and simple. Yeah. <laughs> and how has your camera equipment changed over the years? It's just been Canon for the most part and upgrading the body slowly from a 20D to a 5D to 1DS to a 1DX and then just basically getting a good set of lenses and I'm at the point where I basically have all the right lenses and the only time I ever need to upgrade is if they make like a lens that covers two lenses that I already have or like yeah. an upgrade to a lens that I already have that's major enough to want to do it. And you never tried any other, like, Sony or... You'd realize you're a kind of person from the I was kind of... I was... I just kind of realized I was a little stuck in the whole Canon ecosystem. Yeah. <laughs> Once I started getting more and more equipment, I'm like, I don't really think I could afford to sell all this and get new yeah. stuff. But you never know, because, I mean, I have a lot of stuff. So if, like, Canon's next 1DX or their next mirrorless ends up being really crap compared to the competitors, mm -hmm. then maybe like, okay, maybe it's time to just sell off everything and just switch, you know? Mm -hmm. But I mean, I'm happy so far. Yeah. It's, it's always, there's always faults with everything. Like sometimes Nikon users will be like, oh, I wish I had this that Canon users have, and Canon has, oh, I wish I had what Sony has, and it's just everyone wishing that they all had something, everything, mm -hmm. but it's, you can't really have everything all in one. There's always yeah. a, there's always a negative to every camera system. Mm -hmm. Do you travel with all that? Yeah. I have Whoa. A, I, in a backpack too. I'm just imagining, I'm like, my back is going to break just thinking of that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, luckily I have a good, um, think tank, uh, airport backpack that even though I have like nine lenses and a body in there and a flash, it's actually surprisingly balanced. So like putting it on my back with the straps, oh, yeah, it feels the straps. it feels like, oh, it just feels like it's a little bit pulling me back a little bit, but not bad. But then if you pick it up, pick it up, you're like, oh my God, Can this is heavy, imagine? you know? Like, how do I even have this on my back? Yeah. But every now and then I do need like shoulder massages because it just <laughs> yeah. gets, my muscles just get like rock solid. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> do you do video also? Uh, I've tried and I don't mind it. It just depends on the capacity. Like, um, I want like a few years ago, I wanted to with an artist I worked with. I wanted to do video and I wanted to do like short. Like, they had a they had a videographer that did um, that did uh, what's it called that did recap videos of like they didn't film the entire tour and then they did a recap after movie of the entire tour. And I was just like, you know what? Let me try. Um, let me try video editing and you know I downloaded the trial for the software for Adobe and recorded some videos and put it together to put it to some music and I'm like well this is actually not that bad it's pretty easy I mean I'm not going to be able to do the crazy transitions that a lot of people do yet but it's pretty decent for something basic like a 15 second clip for like Instagram yeah. And then I was like, hey, can I do this too, you know? And I'm like, no. I'm like, okay. <laughs> that kind of killed it a little bit. But I'm always open to it, but for a limited capacity, you know? I, like, yeah. I'd rather... I don't mind editing and doing, like, a little, little recap for social media, but definitely nothing with, like, live audio or something really extensive and extensively long and stuff like that. Or if it's like a collaboration kind of thing where it's like, hey, we have a video guy, just film some stuff in your spare moments in between photos and then give them the raws and they'll put it together kind of yeah. thing. Because with, yeah. with the lenses I have, I could do some really yeah. unique photos. Like I have like 1.2 lenses, I have a tilt shift. I mean, that'll make, that makes for an amazing yeah. video stuff. But yeah. it's tough to... It's, it's kind of like all or nothing kind of in the industry, you know? It's like either yeah. you do tons of video stuff 
or just stick with what you're doing with the thing. Yeah. Is it because the um, for video the time taken to learn everything and do it is just too much? Yeah, and at the same time, it's very tough to. It's it's a bit tough to balance because even down to the settings on the camera, they're different. Like if yeah. you shoot video on the DSLR. Usually you shoot at uh, really high ISO and it's fine. Yeah. But then if you shoot at the same ISO with the photo, it really looks really, really horrible. <laughs> and then mm -hmm. ruins the photo. Yeah. So it I would, it would be tough because you'd have to get the right settings for video. And then when you want to take a photo, then you have to go and change the whole thing over and get the right settings for photo. And then when you want to go back, then you change the right settings for video. And it's a lot of back and forth that's a bit time consuming, you know? Mm -hmm. And... Yeah, it's just, I'd rather focus on, I'm really good at photos, so I'd rather focus on photos, and then if I had downtime, do some video here and there, but not like, not like overdo it, you know? Yeah. How would you say your um, truck B style has changed since the early photos you shot? Uh, the first photos are just like so minimally edited, they're just like contrast and sharpness and stuff like that, just very basic JPEG editing. Then when I got to RAW, then I would just tweak it a bit more, but then also like mess around with presets. And back then the presets were a little overdone. Yeah. They were like, it was like, like a lot. full on blue or green eyes. It's yeah, so it was, tacky looking. It, it was a lot of split toning. And back yeah. then it was like, oh my God, this is, this is pretty new and this is pretty cool. It's like deviant art type yeah. looking stuff. And that's, that's always the problem with like stuff like that is there's always like something that's new and different that even though it's horrible, people will get attracted to just because of that, and then eventually fade out and be like, oh yeah, it was kind of stupid. Mm -hmm. So then after that, like uh, film emulation, of course, was with BSCO was like the next big thing, and then I started using a little bit of that. And like for all presets, it would just be like, I would find something that looks good so as like a base, but then I'd completely change it and edit it, change the colors a little bit. So it'd always be, it's always like a base for me like a quick base and then after that it just became more a little bit more normal looking and I kind of I really like more normal looking photos but with like maybe a little bit more emphasis on a few things you know but nothing that's like not reality based looking you know mm -hmm. just like like a little kick and then I try not to do like the whole the orange teal kind of look even oh, though yeah, yeah some people do that now yeah, it's, there are some looks that are just like, you know, that are good for one or two photos. Like, I'll do the orange teal for like maybe one or two photos in a gallery if it looks good with it. But a lot of times you can't, it, it looks very cheap and it looks very lazy to just like have all your photos edited the exact same way, you know, just, just like take your photos, apply the same preset to all of them and tweak them and be like, okay, here you go. And then it's just kind of like, do you even care about the photos, you know? You're yeah. just like, you're just applying one preset to everything regardless of how the actual photo looks like mm -hmm. but I mean that kind of works if you well I mean the less the less colors you have to work with the easier it is to do something like that so that's why I try to avoid that you know mm -hmm. I try to keep all the colors that are there in there you know what would you say have been the biggest challenge in your career so far it's a good question I don't know just can just continuing with the career, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean it is crazy, like hours and so many, a lot of things going on at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I mean lately, I guess it's just the jet lag, you know. It's yeah. Just because even even though I'm more used to it, like I would when I first started touring, I would get severe, severe insomnia to the point where I had to get a prescription to help me sleep oh, wow. sometimes, and now I. I, and then after that, I kind of was like, oh, I could just take over-the-counter sleeping pills, and then I'll help. And now I'm at the point where I'm so used to traveling in jet lag that I I just sleep naturally. You can sleep anywhere? Not anywhere. <laughs> it's one of those things where I could, when I am tired and I can sleep, I can sleep naturally, normally, but I'll still get affected by jet lag. Yeah. So, like, I just, it takes me that, like, a week to get used to it again. So, like, I got back from Japan on Tuesday of last week, and... Like clockwork, one week later, this this last night, because uh, today is Wednesday, we're filming it. Uh, last night, I got my first full normal sleep without waking up in the middle of the night. Oh my god, jet lag. <laughs> last question: What do I want to be remembered for? Uh, I want to be remembered for good photos. Mm-hmm.
hopefully. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I want people to be able to look at my photos and be like, oh, this was, I remember this, this looks good, this brings me back to that time, you know, just recording history, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. I love this. No <laughs>